That is, that is very good. Thank you all. It's just wonderful to be here. It's great to be part of this event. Uh, it's an amazing group of speakers. I'm so excited to be a part of this and uh, am, am uh, so thankful to the people who put this together. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about gifts today and uh, give some suggestions about how we can all be more creative and innovative. Because frankly, uh, there's a couple things I want to say. One is that we can all be creative and we can all be innovative. And we need to, to work to be creative and innovative. So I want to focus on that today. Uh, frankly, Lincoln, Nebraska, the state of Nebraska and the US, I think creativity and innovation is going to be key going forward. So let's dig right in here. So first of all, we want to start with uh, a picture. I want to talk about gifts first. I want to talk about gifts today. This is a picture of Christmas in the mid-70s in, in, in my house. Uh, I don't remember this Christmas very well, but I do remember the uh, puppet cookie monster that I got that day. But one thing I really remember is this train set that I still have. This is uh, called Silver Streak, and it was the big present of the year. It was advertised. It had a headlight. It had a train uh, a trucking company that came with it. You could load your trucks onto the back of the train, and it was the biggest deal. And when I talk about gifts today, I want you to think of this kind of thing. They're tangible, they're concrete, they're wonderful. They're wonderful for both the person who gives the gift and the person that receives the gift. And I wanted to put this slide in here to emphasize this fact, that we don't want to talk about abstract things, we want to talk about very, very tangible things. So this is another gift, again, I'm dating myself, but this is a, an Atari computer system that I had when I was young. These are my kids playing it here. Uh, the game is Breakout. Does anybody remember the game Breakout? That was a great one. And I want to position Breakout as a great gift, a great gift to me. And with the recent death of Steve Jobs, everybody's going to talk about him. My guess is we'll see him a few times today. A few people know that he was involved with the game Breakout. Does anybody know that one? He was working for Atari. They asked him to build the circuit board for Breakout. And he, being a businessman at this very early age, said, I'll do it for 500 bucks but they wanted to remove chips to make it more compact. And he said, I want 100 bucks for every chip I can remove as a bonus. And they said, fine. And he went to his friend Steve Wozniak, who we, of course, all know. This is all pre-Apple. And said, they want me to redesign this circuit. Can you help me? They're going to give us 500, or 500 bucks for it. So they did this. It went very well. But of course, Steve Jobs, uh, actually Wozniak did the work, reduced the number of chips by 50. So there was a $5,000 bonus. He never told Wozniak about that and pocketed the bonus. Um, but this was a great gift. He was a second, third line engineer working at a software company, and he provided this to me. This is something that I played when I was young, and I guess my kids are playing now. Uh, if he would have stopped here, that would have been nice. That would have been enough. But of course, we know these are my four kids watching a Pixar movie on an iPad. And that's a shocking combination to me. If you want to talk about iPhones and iPods and iTunes, he had a lot of gifts to give. He was a special guy, of course, uh, and it goes on and on and on. So these are tangible, concrete gifts that are wonderful for all of us. So this is the core of my talk. This is the message I want to get across today. This comes from a book by Brenda Euland. If you want to write, it's a wonderful book. It's a top five book for me. There's a fabulous audio book. They have a lady read the audio book, and she must smoke a lot of cigarettes or something. She's got this wonderful voice, and she does a great job. But there are three things I want to emphasize. The first is it's impossible that you have no creative gift. A lot of people I talk to about this will say, Shane, that's great. I'm glad you're doing this. I'm glad you're talking about this, but that's not me. I can't do that. I don't believe that. I think we all have a gift. The second thing you need to remember is it is a gift. You don't take the Silver Streak train that you just got for Christmas and put it under your bed and hide it and never touch it again. It's been said that many of us go to our grave with our gifts still inside of us, with our songs still in us. Don't be that person. You have to work at it. If you want to be creative and innovative, it takes some effort. And second, you cannot be sure that it is not a great gift. And that's the biggest point. Maybe you're the one that has the cure for breast cancer inside of you. Or maybe it's something very trivial and simple, like you're going to give a lot of kids breakout in the future. You cannot be sure that it's not a great gift. So I think all of us sort of have a responsibility 
to develop our gifts. That's it. That's the core message. Of course, I have a little more to say. I want to explain these a little bit. But that's the core message of what we're trying to do. Now, this is a painting by Pablo Picasso, sold for $104 million a few years ago. This is the most expensive painting that's ever been uh, sold, a boy with a pipe. Picasso was special. He was a genius. Unfortunately, this is a bad stereotype people have about innovation and creativity, is that it's all about Picasso. He paints this one. He's 26. He does all his good stuff early. He just knew what he wanted to paint, and he painted it. But I want to tell you that I think that's a myth. I think that's the wrong way to look at innovation and creativity. This is a different painting by Paul Cezanne. He painted this when he was 56. He was a terrible painter most of his life. But he worked at it, and he worked at it, and he had a lot of special things in his life that allowed him to give us this gift. This one sold for only $60 million a few years ago. He was mentored. He had mentors in his life. That's a key word. Uh, he worked with Pissarro when he was young. We're going to switch this out. I talk so loud. I talk so wonderfully. He developed his gift over time. If, if you hear art critics talk about the banquet, which he painted when he was 30s, they all complain about how bad it was. But by the time he was 56, he was doing wonderful things. His father was a banker, supported him, paid his rent. You can all imagine the stories around that dinner table, right? But he worked and worked and developed his gift. Now, this, of course, is uh, an, another one of my daughter, uh, daughters who decided it was nice to give a fashion show. So she picked out the clothes. She made the signs. She made the drinks in the foreground that you can see. She made tickets for everybody. And she put on a fashion show for us in our basement. We're all a lot like that. If you go to a kindergarten, you ask who's an artist, the hand of the hands go up. By seventh, eighth, ninth grade, maybe there's one kid in the back waving their hands. And there's a couple problems. I take a lot of blame for this as an educator. First of all, everything we do in school says there's only one right answer. So think about your job. When was the last time in your job you did something that had only one right answer? Does anybody can you even think of one of those instances? The second thing we do that I think is wrong is we grade people on their own performance. When was the last time you did something in your job that depended only on you? That's never the case in, in, in the work world. And I think it's important for us to to at least realize this. This leads to a lot of constraints we place on ourselves. This is self-portrait for my daughter, Anna. I love this picture because I don't think any adult could draw this picture. This is a kid picture, right? When students come to the university and I speak to them, often I do these little creative exercises. I have them draw a picture of their neighbor. They dig right in and they love it. If I ask everybody here, I want you to sit down and I want you to draw a picture of the person sitting next to you, you would flip out. You would go crazy. I'm not doing that. I'm going to draw them too fat. They're going to think I'm mean. Um, they're going to have the glasses wrong. These are external constraints. There, there's, nothing, there's no penalty with drawing a picture of your neighbor, but we will never do it because we've placed these external constraints on ourselves. And sometimes those external constraints are important. They help us function as a society. But we need to recognize that they're there. We need to recognize that I won't do this simple thing of drawing my neighbor because I'm just unwilling to risk it, and I don't want them to laugh at me, and I'm afraid I'm going to offend them and whatever that list is. You need to become aware of those constraints you've placed on yourself. Now, this is Long's Peak. This reminds me of another wonderful book and wonderful story. Uh, do I look scared there? Because I am. The home stretch at Long's Peak. Uh, another book I love is Orbiting the Giant Hairball by Gordon McKenzie. He was a creative uh, guy at Hallmark Cards. And he talks about how to be creative in a, in a big organization or, frankly, anywhere. He would give seminars. And he was at a seminar in San Diego. He was in the Torrey Pines region, north of San Diego. He wanted to go to the beach. And of course, he goes to the beach, and there's a big cliff separating him from the beach. And there's all the signs. Whatever you do, don't go down the cliff. Don't go down steep, loose rock, all that stuff. And he said to himself, I'm a creative guy. I break the rules. Of course, he climbs over the edge, and he tries to climb down to the beach. He gets halfway down. He's stuck. 20-foot drop. He can't go down. He can't go up. He's stuck. So what? the important part of the story is what happens to him next. He stands there for an hour on the side of this cliff, just wondering what he's going to do. And he's thinking, well, maybe I could make it down. Maybe I should try. No, maybe I'll break both my legs if I try to make it down. Then he'll stand there for a while and he'll say, well, maybe I could make it. And he's there for an hour, and he finally decides, i got to call for help. And he calls down to the beach, and he says, you know, I need help. Somebody come here. Helicopter flies in, he tells the rest of the story, and some young lifeguard rappels down the side of the cliff, puts a harness on him, and lowers him down to the side. 
So there were two takeaways he had from this story that he learned. First of all, for a long time, for an hour, it was equal. Should I break both my legs or should I admit I made a mistake and ask for help? That was even for a while for him. And he was shocked about how close that was. Why was that close? <laughs> this is how serious these constraints are for us. They're real. They're there. The second thing that he wanted to note was how nice the person was who helped him down. He was afraid he was going to get admonished. How stupid. Didn't you read the signs? Weren't the signs there? You saw the signs, right? The guy was nice. He, I'm here to help you. Here's what we're going to do. This is how it's going to work. Asking for help was not a problem. It was a, he overestimated the pain with asking for help and admitting his mistake. So I think those are two important lessons from this silly story, that these constraints are self-imposed and often wrong. Now, I also want to mention Carol Dweck at Stanford University writes a lot about the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. All of us, of course, will look at this and say, of course, I don't have a fixed mindset. Of course, I have a growth mindset. It'd be silly to have a fixed mindset. But when you start listing the characteristics that she does about what's involved with a fixed mindset, you worry about what others think. You worry about where you are relative to others. You think this is fixed. The idea of IQ fits into the fixed mindset. My IQ is 105. That's a ridiculous thing. Your IQ tomorrow may not be 105, or the next part of this talk, maybe I'll get stupider or smarter, these kinds of things. But you can learn. If it's 105 today, it could be 150 at some point. It's, it's just a silly nonsense or nonsensical notion. But we've labeled you 105, smarter than 107, or not as smart as 107. She would say that it's all about how you grow in your life and how you learn and if you continue to learn. And she gives the example of John McEnroe. John McEnroe was born a great tennis player. When things went wrong, he blamed other people, and he yelled at the officials. It's not my fault. I'm the best tennis player in the world. That was in. As opposed to Michael Jordan, who did pretty well at North Carolina, right? Great athlete. Entered the league in 85 in the NBA, not as the greatest player in the world. He shot 18% from the field his first year. When he left the league so many years later as the greatest player in, foot, or in basketball, he shot 33% from the three-point line. He knew that he couldn't out-athlete out people in the NBA. He knew he had to get better from three-point land. And that's why he became the best player of all time in basketball, because he grew, not because he was born the best. This is my son playing a computer game, Scratch, a uh, great little game, but he likes to program video games instead of, actually, we try to force him to program video games more than play video games. He'd like to play video games too, but, but I think this is, can be part of the growth mindset, and I don't put him up here because he's my son, or, well, I do, but he doesn't have a lot of these constraints yet that I've talked about. So this slide I want to show, and I, my guess is that this looks forced and no one will believe me, but I was sitting in a meeting with these students on Monday. And I said, wait a second, let me go get a camera. I want this picture. This is a group of students at the university. They have this crazy idea that you can make little robots like this. That little robot's about this big. And you can put them inside a patient's body, and you can do surgery with this little robot. And there's a lot of surgical procedures where you make a big cut, and we want to make a little hole and put the robot in the inside and do surgery that way. So there's, they have their target application, colon resection. There's 300,000 of these in the U.S. per year. Almost all of them are done with a big cut, five days in the hospital, six weeks before you feel right again. They want to make them a little whole. That's a gift. If they can make 300,000 procedures a year into a small whole procedure, that's a big gift. What I love about this pr picture is that all but two of them are Nebraska kids. And what I realized when I wanted to take this picture is that there's three NSF fellows in this picture, which is a very prestigious award. And I thought about that. There's not, there hasn't been a lot of NSF fellows at the university, but it's because we didn't try. We weren't encouraging. We weren't providing the environment for these kids to apply. We started applying, and now we have three in the room here, being creative and innovative and trying to give a very tangible gift to the rest of us. So hopefully none of us will have colon, re colon uh, resection needed in the future, but I might, so I'm glad they're doing this. So that's it. I want you to encourage, recognize that you have a gift. I want you to work to develop it. And I can talk to you all day about ways to develop it. You can learn to, the proper brainstorming techniques. You can learn about idea generation, graphical techniques, about uh, ways to 
uh, use the lotus blossom is, is another one. There's all kinds of special techniques you can learn to be more creative. You can write a journal. You can keep a commonplace book. There's lots of things you can do, and we can get into that at another time. But it takes effort. You have to recognize that it takes effort. And the key of, of being creative, I think, is being generous. To be creative, I think you have to do things differently than other people, and it has to be good. It has to be something that will benefit other people. And it's a greedy plea I give you today. I want you to be creative, and I want you to give your gifts so I get a lot of gifts. And I'll try to do the same for the rest of for everyone here. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time.